Well, I'm Mike Bloom, and once again, we're going into the book of Revelation, chapter by chapter. And we ask you to share this if you're watching this live. Get the word out there and around. Lesson 17, and going through, as I said, Revelation, chapter by chapter. And we're finishing up. We finished up the vials, and we want to move in from there. But we're going to notice tonight that what you read after Revelation 16, when the vials end and Armageddon is mentioned, you go into chapter 17 and 18 about the harlot, Babylon the Great. So we're really going to focus on that, but we're going to notice something that it was an angel that helped pour out those vials that introduces us to the harlot. So there's a connection. Notice who is introducing each issue, each event, like an angel, one of the angels of the seven vials is introducing us to this harlot. So it has something to do with the vials of wrath being poured out. That's why this angel is involved. But let's go ahead and get right into it. When we read about Armageddon, and then we read about the destruction of the city, we notice a very strong parallel to the book of Ezekiel chapter 5 when the city is divided three times. Look in Revelation 16 and 19, and the great city, now the great city, what was the great city in Revelation 11 and 8? It was Jerusalem, because the great city was spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Of course, that was Jerusalem. And so when we read in Revelation 16 and 19 about the great city, it's once again talking about Jerusalem. And it was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And we're going to show you that in the Greek, it's actually the city of the Gentiles fell. Nations is Gentiles in the Greek. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So, as I noted, Ezekiel chapter 5 has an exact reference to the city being divided three times, and it's explicitly talking about Jerusalem. Notice this. As I said, Revelation 11 and 8. Jerusalem is where Jesus was crucified. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 5 and the first five verses. And as we've said several times already, if you've been watching this, front to back, Ezekiel and Revelation parallel each other, and both of them even end with the new Jerusalem. But look at Ezekiel 5 and 1. Thou son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thine beard. Then take thee balances to weigh and divide the hair. So he shaved off the hair of his head and his beard, and then he would weigh the hair. And he was told to divide the hair. And then in verse 2 it says, Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city. So he'd actually take the hair of his head and beard, divide it into three parts, and burn one third of it. And walk right in the middle of Jerusalem and do this. When the days of the siege are fulfilled, and thou shalt take a third part and smite it about with a knife. See, all this is symbolic. And a third part, this is the final third part, thou shalt scatter in the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirt. Then take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For thereof shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. Now he's starting to interpret it. Just like that hair would be burned, he said a fire would come into the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, this is Jerusalem. That hair that was divided into three parts would represent Jerusalem. He said, I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And this is going to come up later as well as to why the cities of the Gentiles fell when Armageddon occurred and Jerusalem received destruction. 
because God had set Jerusalem in the midst of the nations and the countries around about her. God was using Jerusalem and Israel as a representative, an avenue through whom God would touch the world. That's what Jerusalem was. That's what the temple there was. And of course, they abused their privilege. They abused what God had placed them to be. But he said, this is Jerusalem. And then when you read in Revelation 16 about the great city where 11 and 8 says, where Jesus was crucified, was divided into three parts. And this hair in Ezekiel is being divided into three parts. And it actually says, this is Jerusalem. So it's so plain. Doesn't it scream out to you now that we've been into this so many times? It's, it's everywhere. Look, Ezekiel 5 and 6. And she hath changed my judgments into wickedness. Think of the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Jesus' day. Change my judgments into wickedness more than the nations, more than the Gentiles, and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. Now, this was God's people, Israel, Jerusalem, and they were worse than nations that didn't even know God. What kind of backsliding happened with these people? And of course, Read the New Testament, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you find out how Jesus just scathed the priests, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. For they have refused my judgments and my statutes. They have not walked in them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have multiplied more than the nations that are round about you and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you, Therefore, thus saith the Lord your God, behold, I, even I am against thee and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And I will do in thee that which I have not done and whereunto I will not do any more the like because of all thine abominations. Doesn't that sound like Matthew 24, where there would be tribulation such as never was and never shall be? Well, here we're reading in Ezekiel chapter 5 that Jerusalem would have done to her, which he had never done, and he wouldn't do any more similar. Now, if in Matthew 24, that's a different uh, judgment than upon Israel in Jerusalem. And, and here we're he seeing in Ezekiel a judgment on Jerusalem like it was not done before, and he would not do any more similarly then why does Matthew 24 say there was none like it before or since? The only way these two chapters can harmonize, where Matthew 24 says, tribulation such as never was in the past, never shall be in the future, and Ezekiel says, never which I've done before, and I won't do anything like it in the future, it has to be talking about the same judgment, because if it wasn't, if there are two different judgments, Matthew would be pointing back to this one, and Matthew says it's worse than what was in the past, but this one said it's worse than anything that would be in the future. So the, they would be contradicting each other. They have to be talking about the same judgment. And what's so powerful? In fact, I didn't even let it impact me as much as it is right now while I'm talking to you live. That when Ezekiel says this is Jerusalem, then without contradicting it in Matthew 24, it has to be talking about Jerusalem there. Isn't that powerful? Oh my, people need to see this. And look in chapter 16 and 19. The great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Now this is where I mentioned to you earlier that the words nations here is the Greek, see what it says there? The cities of the Gentiles. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give under the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, go back here to Ezekiel 5, verse 10. Therefore, the fathers, now this is what he said wouldn't be done in the past or in the future. The fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee. Josephus wrote in his history of the war of Jerusalem, this actually happened. People were eating their children. And the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the winds. That's why the hair went into the wind. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee. Neither shall mine eyes spare, neither will I have any pity. He says, you defile my sanctuary, I'll diminish you. 
A third part of thee shall be shall die with the pestilence, and with the famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee. And a third part of thee shall fall by the sword round about. That's why the hair was moved about with the sword and the knife. And I will scatter a third part into all the winds when his hair was thrown up into the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. And so, by the way, when they burned it with fire, that was the pestilence and the famine. So, Moses was told about this cannibalism that Israel would experience in Deuteronomy 28, verses 53 to 57. And we referred to that in previous lessons. Check it out. So, the temple, this is why all the cities of the Gentiles fell also. It said the temple had prayers that were offered for all the nations sacrifices were made for all the nations in that temple. And therefore, that temple was God's way and means and avenue of reaching the rest of the world and touching the nations. So it was like a representative of the world. And when Jerusalem fell, that's why others were said to fall as well. Now, Jerusalem, it would represent and reach all the world. God set it up in the midst of the world as a witness. And then when it says, Great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, that's Jerusalem. Now we're really going to show you that in chapter 17. But notice this. God is said to remember. Now, let's just back up a bit. It says God remembered in Revelation 16. When God usually remembers, it's it's he's remembering a blessing. He remembered them and he blessed them. And and but here, when God remembers, it's like so many other instances of Revelation, it's an opposite. Just like the blood of Jesus of communion that we drink, it's a blessing, but he gives them the blood of the wine or the wine of the wrath of God that they drink, and it's a cursing. Well, here you got God remembering. Now he's not remembering as it usually does for blessing people. It's for wrath in this case. And so in the Old Testament, God would tell people to remember his covenant. In Deuteronomy 6 and 12, Beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now notice he talks about Egypt when he tells them to not forget God who brought them out of Egypt. And then, because they did forget God, and they turned away from him, the plagues of Egypt come upon Jerusalem. That's why you read in all of those uh, vials of these similar plagues of Egypt. Now, again, you're not to take Revelation and the water turning to blood, like the Nile River actually turned to blood. You're not to take that in Revelation literally, because what God is showing you, by taking the plagues that hit Egypt and referring to them with Jerusalem and associating with Jerusalem, it's just identifying Jerusalem to us as Egypt, which is why Revelation 11 and 8 says she was spiritually called Egypt and she was spiritually called Sodom. And so, and again, that's all in detail if you haven't watched the previous videos in previous videos, especially last week. Now, remember... Back in Revelation chapter 6 and 16, people were seeking to hide themselves from the wrath of God. They said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's why we see there's no place to hide because Revelation 16 and 20 says every island fled away and the mountains were not found. They were looking to the mountains to cover them, but the mountains are gone. Now, that doesn't mean mountains are going to disappear in the earth. It simply means there's no hiding place. No hiding place from the wrath of God. Now, here's another connection between Ezekiel and Revelation. Watch this. In, Eze in Revelation 16 and 21, There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Look at Ezekiel 13 and verses 8 to 16. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. My hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower. O ye great hailstones shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Now this is talking about Israel in the land, and the enemies of God would have hail fall on them. And then it's starting to turn on Jerusalem and on Israel now, hail falling on them. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where's the daubing wherewith you've daubed it? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury. God was going to cause such a wind that people say, well, where was the mortar? He said, it's my wind that'll destroy that. And there shall be an overflowing shadow in my sh shower rather, in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. Now notice the language he's using, consuming it, like utterly destroying it. And that's why the vials finish or complete the wrath of God. And there's an utter destruction. And so hailstones weighing a talent are involved here. So I will break down the wall that you've daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof and you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall on them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say unto you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, in other words, that is, the prophets of Israel which prophesy concerning Jerusalem and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. So isn't it interesting? Jerusalem means the city of peace. And uh, this hailstone shower is just what you read about, and it's distinctly upon Jerusalem in Ezekiel. So the hail in Egypt was the fourth plague. So it was also when Joshua took them in to the land of Canaan and Joshua chapter 10. Remember when the sun stood still and never before did God listen to a command by a man when Joshua said, sun stand still and moon, you be still. For the first time, never before and ever since did God do that according to a man's word and the sun stood. That was the same chapter 10 where they took the five kings of the Canaanites and put them in a cave and rolled stones in front of them. And then commanded Joshua, said, Now bring those kings out and put your feet on their heads. Kind of remind you of Satan's head being crushed by the foot of Jesus. His heel shall be bruised. And Joshua means Jesus, is Jesus in Hebrew. Joshua 10 and 11, and this is what also happened. It came to pass as they fled from before Israel, these enemy armies, and we're going down to the Bethrehorn, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. There were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. <laughs> and so God was doing more than what the Israelites were doing. Deborah also talked about stars falling in a battle against Israel's enemy. In Judges 5 verses 19 to 20, the kings came and fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan and Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. Notice that by Megiddo. Armageddon means mountain of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Now, Josephus wrote down that Roman catapults launched stones that actually weighed a talent. The same weight that God said, that those hailstones weighed in Revelation chapter 16. Does that mean that's what that represented? The hailstones represented the catapults? I think prophecies like this are kind of part half and half. That yes, that could be referring to that, but watch this. This is history. Check it out. Josephus actually reported that the, the, the Israelites would holler, the sun is coming. 
when they saw a hailstone launched at them. They'd see this white hailstone come out of the sky and out of the clouds. And it was like they were mocking the Christian's belief that James actually was in the temple before they killed him. This is after the New Testament was written, years later. And he announced that the Son of Man would come in the clouds. And it's like they mocked that when these hailstones would come. And by the way, Rome realized that they could recognize those hailstones because they were white. So Rome started painting them black so they wouldn't recognize them and wouldn't be ready. And it would kill scores of people. Um, So anyway, the next chapters, chapter 17, chapter 18 of Revelation, it shows the actual ending of Jerusalem following the vials of wrath. Like the vials were said to finish up the wrath of God. But watch this. When Jerusalem is revealed to be the harlot, when we get into Revelation 18, 17, the bride, New Jerusalem, is then revealed and ends the book of Revelation with a revelation of her, the New Jerusalem. That's the last thing you read about in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, the New Jerusalem. Come, I'll show you the bride, John. So isn't it interesting that the old Jerusalem... You see, it says Babylon the Great, and people think that Babylon is is Rome, or they think it's the Catholic Church, or they think it's the system of popes, or they think it's the World Council of Churches, the One World Church. Have you heard that before? Well, it's none other than Jerusalem. But what I'm trying to say at this point, I'll explain that even more clearly in later on here, is that if you're reading about a new Jerusalem, that's like the opposite of this Babylon the Great, wouldn't it be even more impacting to learn that that Babylon is old Jerusalem? And that's why it's even more a counterfeit than new Jerusalem. It's the old versus the new. So knowing this is about old Jerusalem being destroyed, and even called Babylon, makes the revelation of new Jerusalem more meaningful. Now, as I said, the angels of the vials are heavily involved, almost as though the remaining chapters are a continuation of the seventh vial. It was said to finish it up, but it's like Revelation 17 and 18, because the last vial said to finish it up, but yet we still still see destruction in chapter 17 and 18. It's like chapter 17 and 18 are detailed explanations of What else happened in that seventh vial? Now, let's stop and think about this too for a minute. We're finding out that from front to back, the book of Revelation is all about the victory of Jesus Christ. You hate Jesus, terrible judgment would come. You love him and unbelievable blessings come. So, This talked about Jerusalem and the cities of the Gentiles. Remember, Babylon came in remembrance before God and the cities of the nations or the Gentiles also. This is referring to Israel and the Roman Empire. You see, the world power in that day was the Roman Empire. Remember, again, I mentioned this several times in Luke, All the world was taxed by Caesar, but it was only the Roman Empire. But the Bible says it was all the world. So we've got to understand that when the Bible talks about the nations and the world, it's the Roman Empire. That's what they understood in John's day, in the New Testament days. So when it talks about Jerusalem and the cities of the Gentiles, it's Israel and the Roman Empire being judged. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because it was the Jews and the Romans that fought the church, crucified Jesus. But again, it's not Jews of today. This is the first century only. It was them and their their generation, their children. That's why Jesus said, this generation won't pass. He didn't mean all the descendants of Israel and Jerusalem and the Jews. And these woes, these judgments, are actually introducing the reign of the Messiah to the whole world. He started ruling as soon as he went up to heaven and sat on that right-hand throne. But it was like that was established and confirmed. I guess being confirmed is the best term to use. 
in AD 70 when everything he said about that generation would happen. The very city, this is what's so significant, the very city that crucified him that was actually called the bride in Ezekiel 16. Her judgment would confirm that he really is the Messiah, the King. And the old setup of the old covenant was being folded up and closed. Do you remember in Hebrews, if you read the first chapter, he says, uh, the heavens are folded up like a garment and wax old. Well, if you go to uh, Hebrews, rather, chapter 8, it says the old covenant was waxing old and fading away like a garment. So when it talks about the heavens being folded up, Hebrews interprets it right in its own book between chapter 1 and chapter 8 of the Old Covenant waxing old and folding up. So what's happening when we see these judgments is God is making a plain fact obvious to everybody. The New Covenant is established. Now, let's go into Revelation 17 and look at the counterfeit bride. And I want to mention that even those who believe, now this is the most popular belief, that Rome is the harlot, and then they get into the Roman Catholic Church and all of that. Even those people who believe that, they still see that this harlot is actually a counterfeit bride. Everybody seems to agree with that. It's more clearly a bride who became an adulteress. The Old Testament always spoke of harlots as cities that left God's covenant. Every time, but twice, only two times, apart from every other time, was it not referring to Israel. But most every other time, it was always Israel. And we'll show you those two exceptions later on. And so everybody sees the harlot like a false church. Everybody, the people that believe it's Rome, the people that believe it's the Roman Catholic Church, the people that believe it's the uh, World Council of Churches, they all call it a false church. But from that point on, where they start saying exactly what city it's talking about, we go into vast differences that are being proposed. Some say, like I said, it's the Catholic Church. Some say it's the, the popery or the system of popes and, and then the World Council of Churches. But John is going to prove it's a first century issue when the Roman Catholic Church didn't exist. When um, the World Council of Churches didn't exist. It has to be first century because look at this. We know many churches throughout history have been false, right? But that doesn't mean they're the harlot. All of us agree with that. This is the harlot. But John said something that said that that harlot had to be in existence in his day. Watch what he said. In chapter 17, verse 18, the woman which thou sawest is that great city. In other words, there was a city. Didn't say it's going to be a particular great city. It says there's a great city right now, and that harlot is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. It was already reigning. It didn't say it would reign. It said it's reigning, ruling. And people that were reading that book in John's day, now remember the people that John wrote Revelation to, the seven churches of Asia? They were in existence in John's day when he wrote that. Chapter 1 talks about them. It lists them out in chapter 2 and chapter 3 tells us the words that they were supposed to read to those churches. And so the rest of the book is just a continuation. It was written for them to read. So they're told to separate themselves and come out from among them, come out of her, my people, making it something that had to be in their day. It had to be. Because the people reading it, we're being told something that had nothing to do with them, but yet it was addressed to them. He said, write to the seven churches, the things which are, the things which have been, the things which shall be. And if it includes telling those people to leave it, leave that harlot, then it has to be something in effect in their day. And the Catholic Church wasn't. The World Council of Churches wasn't. The Illuminati wasn't. The Masons weren't. The Jesuits weren't. <laughs> and all these theories about who this harlot was, only thing that was in effect that the rest of the Bible calls a harlot 
is Jerusalem. I'm going to show you that. Some of you are already way ahead of me because you know that. But uh, by the way, remember we mentioned this a few weeks ago? Another strong, screaming, loud witness that Revelation was talking about the first century is those same people in those seven churches were told, the ones of those of you who have wisdom, let him count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man. Now, if the man wasn't in existence then, how are they going to count the number of the beast and know what the man that it is? Again, it's so simple when you think of it. Why didn't we notice that before? But it just screams at you that it's definitely first century. I mean, aside from all the dozens and dozens that we've covered now, scriptures and prophecies that in the Old Testament that are so similar to Revelation and always pointing to Jerusalem, then we've got statements that you come out of that city right now, you people in the seven churches. You come out of her. And you people that are reading this, you can count the number of the beast because it's the number of a man. I mean, it seems so obvious once you see it. Now, we can apply this and what's in Revelation even to the harlot church to other situations since then. But they're just that, only applications. We can apply anything. We can apply uh, Jesus walking on the water to our situation as though we can walk over our troubles that seem to uh, drown us. But first and foremost, that story about Jesus walking on water is he really walked on water. And first and foremost, the book of Revelation was dealing with first century situations. So it's about Babylon versus New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, if you read it, do you remember you see that there's the river of life? There's the tree of life with all these fruit of life? Well, that was in the Garden of Eden. But the reason you're seeing the tree of life in a city is because the Garden of Eden, spiritually speaking, was meant to develop into a city. If whatever city you're in, whatever community you're in right now, was once just a wooded area, just wilderness and forests or what have you, and by people being there and populating that region, it became known as towns and communities and cities and metropolises. And so that's why the Garden of Eden and the New Jerusalem have the tree in it, because that is the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem, rather, is the garden developed and finally completed. But the other city called Babylon, we've already said this, is actually Old Jerusalem. And she was the bride that committed adultery and was unfaithful to God. And it plainly, explicitly says that in the Bible. You know, Babylon literally means the gate of God. That's what it means. And, and God wanted Babylon, of course, as any other nation in any other city, to be blessed. And it should have been holy. It should have been a people that were holy. But they departed from God. And the Tower of Babel, watch this parallel. Remember the Tower of Babel? How they said, let us make us a name and let us build us a tower that it may reach to heaven. It should have been like Jacob's ladder reaching to heaven. It should have had angels ascending and descending. But it became in the opposite, man exalting himself as God, so forth. And it's like a counterfeit of Jacob's ladder. Just like there was uh, Judas counterfeit of Jesus Christ and so forth and Isaac and Ishmael and David and Saul and you go on and on. See, look at what Jesus said in John 1 and 51 and think of Jacob's ladder. He saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see this heaven open and this angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Well, in Genesis 28 and 12, Jacob dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and on the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So Jesus is that ladder to heaven. There's a good sermon out there for some of you preachers. Jesus is the way. No other way to the Father but by me. He's like the ladder. Angels descending and ascending on the ladder, well, it would be on the Son of Man, according to Jesus. But so here you're seeing counterfeits, just like the old and the new Jerusalem. The first Babylon, the original one, left God. Let us make us a name. Right after, right after uh, which 
in, in Genesis 12, this is Genesis 11, let us make us a name. When you go to Genesis 12, God said the opposite to Abraham. I'm going to make your name great, and I'm going to bring you to a land. And when you go to Genesis 11, the people went to their own land that they chose, and they were going to make themselves a great name. But God stopped that, and he said, I'm going to make your name great, Abraham. Isn't that wonderful? But you see opposites all through the Bible. And in Genesis 11 and 9, therefore the name of it is called Babel, and Babel means confusion. So when Babylon meant gate of God, it became confusion like the opposite. Because the Lord God did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And isn't that interesting that Jerusalem means city of peace? But it became the opposite. It became like another Babylon, Babylon the Great, confusion, when it should have been the gate of God. Isn't that powerful? Look at Isaiah 1 and 21. How is the faithful city become a harlot? See, a city that's a harlot, like you see in Revelation 17, according to the Old Testament, was a faithful city, was a bride once, a faithful wife. It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Couldn't that be anything other than Jerusalem? Of course, Isaiah was talking about Jerusalem. Now look at how the harlots judge. Priests in the Old Covenant were meant to bring the bridegroom to the bride. Remember in Matthew chapter 21 too, uh, when the son would go and get the fruits from the vineyard and he would collect them? Well, similarly, the priests were supposed to bring the fruit and the glory to God. And just like they were supposed to bring the bridegroom and introduce him to the bride. These priests of Israel failed to do that, so the bride started looking for other husbands. And you might say, that poor bride, if she'd only had the priest guiding her, it would have been better. And that initially is the way it was originally. The priests just weren't bringing her to the bridegroom. But, and by the way, that's the, the false prophet, the beast that came from the land. When the beast that came from the sea in Revelation was seen, that represented Nero, the Roman Empire, and all the Caesars. But the beast from the land that commanded everyone in the land, all in the earth, which means all in the land, to worship the beast, uh, that is the ministry of Israel. That's the priesthood of Israel who were so backslidden that they pushed Israel toward Rome. We have no king but Caesar. And they even said, Pilate, if you don't crucify him, you're not a friend of Caesar. And so... That's the false prophet. And so these priests weren't doing their jobs of pushing them to Jesus the king. They were pushing Israel to Caesar as king. And so in Revelation 13, that's when you see the land, the people of the earth or the people of the land, that talks about the land of Israel, commanded to worship Rome or the beast. But the bride that they didn't lead to Jesus who had to look for other husbands because the priests wouldn't lead her that way. She's guilty too. And we're now seeing her judgment in chapter 17. Look at verse 1. There came one, and here's the connection to the vials. One of the seven angels which had the seven vials. Why is it an angel that had the seven vials? Introducing and saying, to me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters. It must be because the vials that are supposed to finish up the wrath are including what you read about in Revelation 17 about the harlot. They were the final wrath, but yet we're seeing more wrath here. The judgment of the harlot, it's got to be part of the vials. Now, sitting on many waters, the whore that sits on many waters, that comes from a reference to the original Babylon in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah 51 and 13, it's talking about the original Babylon, where Israel was taken captive. And notice he calls the original Babylon, O thou that dwellest upon many waters. But look what it refers to these waters as. Look how it elaborates about these waters. Abundant in treasures. It's like blessings. Thine end is come, and the measure of thy covenant, covetousness. So the reason it was called a place sitting on many waters was because of the Euphrates River. Remember the Euphrates River? That when Belshazzar's writing on the wall happened, that 
it was because the Medo-Persians had diverted the Euphrates River, which you read about in Revelation, the Euphrates being dried up, and the Medo-Persians came in and conquered. Well, there was the river Euphrates plus many canals. So it was said to be a city sitting upon many waters. But it's also talking about the blessing because Babylon was in the middle of the wilderness. So when you're in the middle of the wilderness and you're in the desert and you've got all these waters and these canals, you're blessed. So God was blessing Babylon and she was capitalizing on it for her own wickedness. And that's exactly what Ezekiel chapter 16 shows about Jerusalem. But when we go to Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel said that the cloud that came from heaven with the cherubim and the four living creatures sounded like many waters. Chapter 1 and 24, when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters. And the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech is the voice of a host or an army. When they stood, they let down their wings. And Jesus sounded like he had a voice of many waters. In Revelation 1 and 15, his feet were like fine brass as if they burned in his furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now we're talking about Babylon, the whore that sat on many waters, and we're showing you that throughout the whole Bible, many waters does depict a blessing. In Revelation 14 and 2, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters. And as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And in Revelation 19 and 6, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of the mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So not only does many waters represent blessing where Babylon had the treasures, but it's also praise and glorifying God. And this harlot was on many waters. It's screaming at us that this is Jerusalem. She had a basis of many blessings, many waters. Hallelujah chorus would go forth like many waters. That what she, that's what she was on. Now, we do read that the many waters are many people, much people. But that's an aspect of this just as much as this blessing is when we read about many waters. We have to get all the references to it. So they mean blessing, these many waters, and worship. And I'm getting ready to close here tonight. So knowing that this is Jerusalem makes sense because she was blessed, but now she's a harlot. Many waters, like I said, it means many people later, but there is a connection to blessing. And this is where I'm going to close tonight. Ezekiel 16 shows Jerusalem. If you read about it, it's like God is, finds her in the wilderness, just like when Israel came out of Egypt and she became the old covenant people at Mount Sinai. They had a covenant. Well, God looked at that like a wedding. It's, he looked at it like he married her. And after it says that, it said she started departing from God. And in verse 16 and 2, chapter 16 and 2, it's talking about Jerusalem. Caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. That's the identity. And then when you get to verse 8, he said, you became mine. I passed by you. I looked upon you. The time of Your time was the time of love. I spread my skirt over you. That talks about marriage. And covered you, your nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee. The old covenant was God marrying them. Saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. But look at chapter 16 and 15. You played the harlot. See the words in red? In chapter 16 and 20, your whoredoms. In chapter 16 and 22, your whoredoms. You've not remembered the days of your youth. 16 and 25, you multiplied your whoredoms. And I didn't quote all the verses, but seven more times she's called a whore and a harlot in Ezekiel 16. And people wonder, is the harlot something other than Jerusalem? Not when you read this. And Romans 2 and 17 says, Behold, you're called a Jew and you rest in the law and you make your boast of God and you know his will and you approve the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. And you're confident that you yourself, you're a teacher and a guide of the blinds, of the blind rather, a light of them which are in darkness, instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. You have the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? 
Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. And all of this screams out to us that Israel had the blessings, the many waters, but like a wife committing adultery against her husband, she departed from God and got the judgment she deserved for it, outlined all through the old covenant law, especially like we told you in Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30. And uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah said, how has the faithful city become a harlot? And oh my, isn't it something? And we can apply that to us and we can apply it and make sure that we remain faithful to Jesus Christ as believers. But first and foremost and primarily, it was talking in Revelation about Jerusalem. The people in that day were to come out of her. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem and surrounded with armies, you get out of there and go to the mountains because she's going down. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for opening up Revelation to us as we dig deeper towards the end of the Bible now. Chapter 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 of Revelation. Continue to guide us so that we see your kingdom. You've been on that throne on Mount Zion now for 2,000 years. You're coming as a king, but not to begin your kingship. You're just going to enhance that kingship even more. Because when you come and you sound that trumpet, our bodies are going to be made immortal. Like you meant Adam to physically live forever in this earth and have dominion. And that is the kingdom of God in absolute maturity. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Hold on. Stick with us. We've got a few minutes left for some questions, comments, and answers. And God bless you so much for watching this tonight.